DNC-3 came nearly six years after the first visit of the angel Moroni, and Section 2 which resulted from that visit. Now, a lot of important history happened during that time which is worth quickly reviewing to help us understand the backstory to DNC-3. So, shortly after Moroni's first visit, Joseph's older brother Alvin passed away unexpectedly, bringing deep sorrow to Joseph's family. For the next three years, always on September 22nd, Joseph had annual meetings with Moroni, where he was taught and prepared for his future mission. Near the end of 1825, Joseph met his future wife Emma Hale while boarding at her home in Harmony, Pennsylvania, as he worked on an exploratory dig for a silver mine rumored to exist somewhere in the region. They were married just over a year later in January 1827, and it was later that year, at his annual meeting with Moroni on September 22nd, that Joseph was at long last entrusted with the plates and the Urim and Thummim. Shortly thereafter, an acquaintance of the Smith family named Martin Harris became interested in Joseph's work. Harris lived across town from the Smiths and, in 1827, was 45 years old and respected in the Palmyra community. His neighbors thought of him as an honest, industrious, hard-working farmer, shrewd in his business, frugal in his habits, and a prosperous man in the world. Martin had previously hired Joseph as a day laborer on his farm, and Joseph had earlier confided in him about the angel and the plates. And shortly after Joseph had obtained the plates, he sent for Martin Harris, because the Lord assured him that Martin would assist him in the work. After meeting with Joseph, Martin said he went home and retired to my bedroom and prayed God to show me concerning these things. And I covenanted that if it was his work, I would put forth my best ability to bring it before the world. He then showed me that it was his work by the still small voice spoken in the soul. Then I was satisfied that it was the Lord's work, and I was under a covenant to bring it forth. Because of efforts by some to steal the plates, Joseph and Emma decided to move from Palmyra to live near Emma's parents back in Harmony, Pennsylvania. Martin Harris gave them $50 to help them on their journey. In Harmony, between December and February, Joseph began copying a considerable number of characters off the plates and even translated some of them using the Urim and Thummim with Emma, now pregnant with their first child, acting briefly as Joseph's scribe and copyist. That February, Martin Harris arrived in Harmony with the intent to assist Joseph. He said the Lord had inspired him to take some of the copied characters from the plates to New York City to have them examined by scholars, which he did, and upon returning from that trip, was more convinced than ever that the plates were ancient and that Joseph was called of God. Martin then began scribing for Joseph for a period of nearly two months until they had completed the translation of the book of Lehi. At this point, Martin asked Joseph if he could take the manuscript home with him to Palmyra to read to his friends that, peradventure, he might convince them of the truth. At this time, Martin's reputation was being tainted back home by his wife Lucy, who was telling her neighbors that Joseph had deceived her husband into giving him money. He wanted Joseph to let him take the manuscript home to prove his wife wrong and clear his good name. Joseph said, I inquired of the Lord, and the Lord said unto me that he must not take them. But Martin urged him to inquire again. So Joseph inquired again, and was again denied. And also the third time, to which the Lord finally said, Let him go with them. The Lord knew what was about to happen, and what a painful but important lesson 22-year-old Joseph Smith was about to learn. As an indication of the Lord's disappointment in Joseph's repeated requests, both the plates and the Urim and Thummim were taken from him shortly thereafter. Martin set out for Palmyra with the 116 pages of manuscript on June 14th. The next day, Emma gave birth to their first child, who lived only briefly before passing away. And for the next two weeks, Emma herself seemed to hover between life and death. As she began to recover, Joseph's anxiety turned to the manuscript. When Martin didn't return as planned, Joseph traveled back to Palmyra only to find his worst fears confirmed. Martin had lost the manuscript. Joseph demanded that Martin go find it, but Martin said it was no use. He had searched everywhere, and it was gone. At that moment, a terrible flood of regret and guilt erupted in Joseph's soul. Oh, my God, my God, Joseph said in anguish. All is lost. What shall I do? I have sinned. 
It is I that tempted the wrath of God by asking him for that which I had no right to ask. I should have been satisfied with the first answer, which I received from the Lord. He told me that it was not safe to let the writing go out of my possession. How shall I appear before the Lord? Of what rebuke am I not worthy from the angel of the Most High? Joseph's mother wrote that he wept like a tender infant. And the next day, when Joseph left, they parted with heavy hearts. Upon returning to Pennsylvania, without the 116 pages, Joseph was met by Moroni, who handed him the Urim and Thummim, indicating the Lord had a message for him. Joseph inquired of the Lord through the Urim and Thummim and received the revelation which we now call Doctrine and Covenants 3. So that's the backstory. Now let's take a look at the Lord's message. Verses 1 through 3 contain a critical reminder to Joseph that mortals cannot frustrate the works and designs of God, only their own works. Verses 4 through 8 and 15 contain an unfiltered rebuke of Joseph and lists his sinful tendencies, namely that he has often transgressed the commandments and the laws of God and gone on in the persuasions of men and feared man more than God and set at naught the counsels of God and suffered the counsel of God to be trampled upon from the beginning. In other words, Joseph had a tendency to fear disappointing man more than he feared disappointing God. He was therefore susceptible to the persuasions of men, in this case Martin Harris, to do that which was against the will and counsel of God. Verse 9 warns Joseph that even though he was called of God, if he is not more aware of his sinful tendencies, he will fall. Then in verses 10 and 11, The tone shifts to one of hope and reconciliation, reminding Joseph that God is merciful to foolish sinners. Therefore, Joseph should repent of his commandment breaking and know that he is still chosen and again called to the work. Otherwise, if he doesn't repent, he will become as other men and have no more gift. Verses 12 through 14 proceed to list the sins of Martin Harris, underscoring further why Joseph should never trust in flawed mortal men more than in God. Finally, verses 16 through 20 conclude with the Lord's assurance of the inevitability of the success of God's work generally and of the inescapable destiny of the Book of Mormon specifically. That is, he explains, that the Book of Mormon will bring a knowledge of a Savior to the modern descendants of the Nephites, Jacobites, Josephites, Zoramites, Lamanites, Lemuelites, and Ishmaelites. This was a promise the Lord made to their forefathers anciently and no mortal can stop him from fulfilling his promises. God will ensure that this book comes forth and informs the descendants of these ancient people of the promises of the Lord, so that they may believe the gospel, rely on the merits of Jesus Christ, be glorified, and through their repentance, be saved. And so, from Doctrine and Covenants 3, Joseph learned that God is merciful to the flawed and foolish who repent, and that in spite of their mortal imperfections, Neither Joseph Smith or Martin Harris nor anyone else can destroy God's work. Not even the loss of the 116 pages of manuscript could prevent God from keeping his promises to bring the Book of Mormon forth so that modern people can come to a knowledge of their Savior, turn to him, and be saved. And that's the story of Doctrine and Covenants 3.